In the last lecture segment, I focused on DevOps culture. And one of the key things which sort of informs DevOps culture is lean. Lean is a methodology which is really widespread in the manufacturing sector globally. You'll commonly find lean implemented as part of a Six Sigma program where its focus is on improving the quality of manufacturing. It's, so its focus is on decreasing the amount of defects in the manufacturing process and ultimately improving manufacturing yield. Lean has a number of goals at its, at its core. One of its goals is to eliminate waste within a system, which is called MUDA. So you could think of this as imagine you had a process which included a number of different steps. One way to eliminate waste with, within that process would be to, to either improve the efficiency of one of those tasks or perhaps remove that task altogether. Maybe you have a task which is performed manually and you could improve efficiency by automating that task. Lean also is focused, as I mentioned, on product quality. And it does that by, by implementing a continuous improvement process, also known as Kaizen. With continuous improvement, you're sort of constantly monitoring the results from a process, and you're taking that as a sort of feedback loop, as an input, back into the, into the process itself. You're sort of, you're, so you're constantly trying to figure out, how do I improve a process, make it more efficient? How do I improve the quality of the output from that process? Lean also focuses on culture, and, and an important aspect of the lean culture is a respect for people. The leaders within a lean organization operate as, as servant leaders. They're, they're, they are there not to tell people what to do, but to help people overcome challenges and, and to solve problems. So in order to understand DevOps practices and some of the methodologies that we follow when building out things like software delivery pipelines, I think it's important for you to understand some of the more theoretical parts of Lean. And one of the key theories that's underpinning Lean is something called the theory of constraints, which was developed by Eli Goldratt. And what he said was that you could think of any process as sort of a chain of links. So every single task within that process is sort of a link within this, within a, you know, a long stretch of chain. What he says is that if you improve the strong links in that chain, it doesn't necessarily strengthen the chain. Because in order to improve the strength of the chain, you really need to focus on the weakest link first. And how that applies to our processes is to think about sort of the throughput of work through a process. If you have a process which requires you to perform a number of different steps, there's generally at least one step within that process that serves as a bottleneck. It's, it's a constraint on throughput. You know, it could be a step which requires a substantial amount of time, or perhaps it's a, a, a highly risky step, one that could only be, be performed by a, a single highly specialized individual. If you were to improve the performance or the efficiency of 
any other step other than that constraint, other than that bottleneck, you're not really going to be able to improve the throughput of that entire process because the throughput of that process is really constrained by that one single step. And so our goal within a DevOps organization as we're building out soft software delivery processes is to always be looking for the constraint within our organization. And if we're looking to automate certain steps or processes, we want to really focus on the processes which are bottlenecks, which are constraints first, because those are the, the, the processes which are, are impeding our service delivery. Here's a quick example, and to put it in a, a software development context. Well, imagine if you had a software delivery process that required 40 hours of effort to test new software code. And then it only took 10 minutes to deploy that software into a, a staging or test or, or production environment. Well, so if you were to try to improve your, your software delivery process, where should you focus your time and energy on first? How should you prioritize your effort? Well, in this case, it would make a lot more sense to focus on the testing process first because the testing process is really the biggest constraint that you face in terms of improving your cycle time. Now, cycle time from a, a software engineering perspective is the amount of time it takes from you know, to to get code from an inception phase to delivery phase to you know to deployment in some sort of of production like environment and so it only takes you 10 minutes to actually deploy the software but it takes 40 hours to test it if you're going to spend a time, your time and effort to you know towards improving cycle time you would want to invest that in the, the improving the, the testing effort first. It's also important to understand a little bit about lean queuing theory because lean queuing theory has made a major impact on methodologies like Agile and DevOps. And to understand why, you need to think a little bit about how we push work through our organization. Now, traditionally, software companies w would think about work and think about think about allocating work to people like sort of like a traditional uh, a sort of assembly line, like a traditional manufacturer. The idea was that all of our software engineers are sort of interchangeable people and we just need to, to bring the right people to the right work and we have to ensure that our software engineers are working at peak efficiency. I, I, remember, I remember years ago that project managers would tell me that they're, they're trying to make sure that all of the software developers are, are working at 100% efficiency. 100% of their, of their time is devoted to coding and working on the, their, their assigned software projects. And that's, that's just impossible. I mean, human beings can't work in a business environment at 100% at efficiency. They'd be lucky in a software development organization to be working at 60% efficiency. Well, th this sort of thinking is based uh, around what we call the, the sort of traditional utilization thinking. It's a sort of Tayloristic model where the focus of the organization is, is on operating all of its human resources at peak capacity. 
companies are trying to optimize locally within their organization rather than taking sort of a system level view. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that project managers are, are focused on maximizing the efficiency of the people rather than focusing on the efficiency of the work itself and the output from that work and trying to get that work through a system of people. Lean and also DevOps methodologies focus more on throughput thinking. And, and this, is, this is a thought process whereby we are trying to identify the constraints within our organization, and we're trying to minimize those constraints. We're trying to make them more efficient so that we can reduce or we can, so that we can, we, we can improve the effectiveness of our delivery process. We can improve the throughput of work through the entire organization. So again, we're thinking about efficiency at an organization level, at a system level, versus focusing on individuals and trying to improve the efficiency of individuals within the system. And it turns out that the software development process really aligns well with this sort of system utilization thinking. And that's because software development is very much a creative process from, a, from sort of a mathematical perspective, we consider it to be what's called a stochastic system with cues. This means that it's a, a, a system that if we were to model it, is a system that's nonlinear, it's non, non-deterministic. That, that means that there's, there's an awful lot of randomness that occurs within a software organization. There are all kinds of considerations that, that, that we need to make um, where we don't have really good visibility in terms of how work is actually progressing locally through the system. And oftentimes the behavior of this sort of stochastic system will defy every instinct that we have. And here's a good example. Um, I remember, you know, years ago when I worked in uh, larger software organizations, the software managers and, and project managers were really focusing on large projects or what we call large batch sizes of features and changes. And the idea was that, you know, if, if we want to you know, produce a lot of work, a lot of output, then we need to have a big team. We need to have a big set of requirements and changes and stories. And we need to focus on delivering all those changes at once. And, and so we would we would spend months and months and months of effort accumulating all of these changes and then deploying them sort of in, in one big release or one large batch size. So, but the, but the problem that, that we faced in these software organizations is that the larger the project was, the larger the cycle time became. You know, it took it. You know, as the projects got lo- larger, it took longer and longer to actually get code deployed and released to a in, in a production environment. And what lean queuing theory shows us, and and actually proves, is that large batch sizes increase cycle time. It makes it actually harder uh, to to get work done. As we utilize people to a greater extent, as we increase the utilization of our individual software developers, it actually makes our cycle time worse. 
which is it kind of defies our instincts, right? You I mean as a think of yourself as a project manager, you would think that as you improve the utilization of the software developers on your team, that you would actually get more work done. But that's not truly the case. It actually, in most cases, you'll get less work done because you've in, in, increased their utilization. And the reason why comes down to something called Little's Law. And, uh, it, and, and again, this is based on lean queuing theory. And what Little's Law tells us is that the only way to maximize throughput of, of work within our organization is to minimize work in progress or what we call WIP. If you're, if you're, if you've ever practiced say a Kanban sort of software development methodology, you would have, you'd be familiar with WIP, but the only way to maximize throughput in our organizations by minimizing work in progress through the organization, through the system by using small batch sizes. And this is the primary reason why agile software development methodologies are really popular in organizations today, because they actually Im improve the throughput of work through the system. Instead of people working on really large, big, multi-week, multi-month projects, they work on very, very small projects. They work on small batch sizes. If you're following like a, a sprint methodology, you might have something like a two-week sprint where the feature and all the work that you're doing has to be completed within a, a small two-week window. And you're, you're constantly pushing out new features and, and new changes. But they're smaller. They're smaller pieces. We take a bigger, a bigger project, a bigger feature, and we break it down into smaller components because of Little's Law, because we want to maximize the throughput of work through our organization. And again, in order to do that, we need to minimize the size of the work that we're performing and, and produce work in smaller batch sizes. In our traditional organization, if you think about our software development life cycle, you can sort of divide it into sort of two different domains. One is what I call the developer land domain, and the other is the operations land. And the developer land domain, we're, you know, we're engaged in, in sort of inception, and we're identifying business processes, you know, feature requirements, we're matching those with you know, different sort of architectural models and patterns. And then our software developers are writing code. They're building and composing software applications. At some point, then they throw it over the wall into operations land. And our operations people are deploying that code to a production environment. They are, you know, sort of managing the service, making sure it's secure, and they're monitoring it. And they sort of, this, this life cycle then uh, continues. In a modern software organization, both the development team members and the operations team members are involved in all aspects of the service delivery life cycle. It just happens to be the case that developers tend to be more focused on earlier phases of the life cycle and the more operations minded people are more focused on the latter stages of the life cycle. But both the developers and the operations team members have shared accountability for the service delivery. And one way to, to build this sort of shared accountability is a process called design for operations. And, and this is a process which is very common in a manufacturing environment. You can imagine that 
when you've got a team of designers that are sitting around and they want to build a, a new car, they want to sort of design a new car. When they're designing that car, they have to keep the manufacturing process you know, top of mind. It's no good to design a fabulous, amazing, innovative new car if it's nearly impossible to actually build it on, in the manufacturing plant. And the same is true in the software world. Oftentimes what we find is that in a, in a traditional software organization, the software developers aren't taking into account the operation of that software platform. They're not taking into account the deployment, management, and support phases of the, of the service. And, and it, every, every piece of code you write has what we call a long tail, meaning that when you write code and you ultimately you deploy that code, it might only take you, you know, days or weeks to write that code, but that code will be running and will need to be supported perhaps for years, even decades in some cases. And so when you're creating that code, you need to take in, into account all the, the entire life cycle of that code. And that means that you need to think about some of the non-functional requirements of the, the, the service that you're building. You need, to, you need to think about how will your software code scale in the future? How will you support high availability? How is your customer service team going to be supporting the new feature that you are building? And the, the way we sort of encourage this design for operations idea in a DevOps culture is through collaboration. And, and, and so what happens is that oftentimes the operations team members will participate in software planning discussions. This, uh, the operations team members will sit in, in, in the scrum planning meetings. They'll participate in the stand-up meetings. And they're there to ensure that the non-functional requirements are being met as part of the software design process. They're there to make sure that the illities are addressed. Things like availability, scalability, supportability, testability, and, and so on. Well, what is the developer's role? You know, the operations people are sitting in on the development team member uh, meetings and in, in helping to, you know, inform them on the sort of operational aspects of the code that they're building. Developers will also participate because they, they are also accountable for service delivery. They'll participate in the service delivery process and in support. This, this ultimately will build accountability, you know, the, so that operation, the, the, the developers can get a, might get a page in the middle of the night if the service that they're building goes down. They're on the front line just like the operations team members are. They, they essentially have to eat their own dog food. If, the, if developers are writing really crappy code, then they're going to get a page at 2 a.m. in the morning, and they're going to be inconvenienced, not just the operations team members. And this, this is, by the way, is very different than the, the way things were traditionally done. Traditionally, you'd have the operations team member, and, and they would get the call in the middle of the night if there was a problem with the, the service. In a modern organization, the software developers are right there on the front line, and, and they are also accountable for the, the software that they are building. Well, if, if the developers are on the front line along with the operations team members, does that mean that they have like full administrative access to, to all of the production environments? Do we give them root access to, to servers that are supporting the software? Well, you know, it's possible that we would do that. 
but um, generally w- what we would do is give the development teams and team members enough access to our production systems so that they can troubleshoot common issues. We give them access to things like infrastructure and application logs. We give them access to metrics that we are collecting from the production environment. We give them the ability to remediate issues in the platform by pushing out updates through our software delivery pipelines. I mentioned that transparency was a key part of of a DevOps culture. And this is, again, a a key lean principle. This idea that staff are empowered to improve quality within the organization. In In a lean manufacturing facility, every member of the production line is empowered to stop the line at any any time. Uh, in fact, in some production lines, they'll have like a big button or a, a, or a cord that you can, you can pull down on. And when that's triggered, the entire production line will stop. Everyone on the production line, including the managers, will then swarm together. And their, their highest priority focus is on solving whatever quality problem has has been surfaced at that time. And, and so it's very collaborative, very transparent. If people notice that there's a problem with quality in the delivery process, they make sure that everyone is aware of it and everyone jointly together will try to address the problem. When there are service problems within a DevOps organization, which are inevitable, anytime you're pushing out changes to a highly complex software platform, you run the risk of introducing new service problems and new defects. Well, when those, when those service issues occur, we try to address those at a post-mortem meeting. And this is a meeting that's scheduled within about two days after an incident occurs. And the the focus of this meeting is to try to determine the cause of the incident and to try to identify the corrective actions that need uh, to take place. It's a a continuous improvement sort of meeting. How do we how do we ensure that this incident never happens again? The purpose of the meeting is not to assign blame. It's not to try to, to figure out who caused the problem. And in so many organizations that I've worked with in my career, the, the focus of, of these types of meetings has been on individuals. You generally have some senior leader out there that is looking to point the finger at, at a person specifically within the organization. And, and that's a, that is a very good sign of a poor culture. Our goal is not to assign blame because again, people, yes, people can make mistakes, but generally those mistakes are a result of other deficiencies within the organization related to training or documentation or a, a poorly designed process. Our goal in a post-mortem meeting is to figure out the causes and then figure out what corrections we can make to mitigate these sort of service issues in the future. And it turns out, believe it or not, that people like to work in very transparent organizations. They like to work in organizations which have a blameless culture because that's a, that's a culture that feels more safe to work in. And if you're working in a culture that's transparent and blameless, then people are generally more willing to participate in discussions and raise awareness of potential issues within the, uh, within the technology platform. And if people make mistakes, they're, they're less 
likely to, to try to hide those mistakes. They'll be more forthcoming and more willing to discuss why the mistake occurred. And finally, people are generally more willing to experiment in, in a transparent culture because it, the, you know, it's, the, the, one of the, the things that you'll find with experimentation is that you'll make mistakes all the time when experimenting. And when you experiment and make a mistake, instead of people pointing at you and blaming you for the mistake, they'll ask you, what have you learned? And how can we use that learning to improve the organization? There have been all kinds of studies that have been done. There's a very prominent Google study that talked about the safety culture within an organization and how that was a a primary factor contributing to the happiness of employees and the retention of employees within companies. The DevOps culture and the lean culture embraces change. I mentioned earlier that DevOps cultures recognize that changes are inevitable. They're, they're going to happen whether we want them to or not. So we try to embrace change because it's, it's going to happen. In, in Lean, we learned that Lean embraces smaller batch sizes, meaning that we're actually increasing the frequency of change in the organization. A traditional software organization perhaps is, is deploying changes like once every quarter or maybe once every six months. Once a, once a year in, in some organizations, they're not changing very often. But when you begin to implement lean practices and DevOps practices, you are now starting to create smaller batch sizes of changes. And therefore, you are releasing changes more frequently. And it turns out that the more frequent we do something, the more frequent we change, the better we get at making changes. It's kind of like, imagine a, a, um, a championship sports team. You might have some of the best players in the world on your team, but if that team only gets together like once every three months and practices together, it's unlikely that they're going to actually be able to win a championship because they just they don't get to they don't get to do it all that they don't get to work together all that much they don't have the opportunity to practice and so in our modern software organizations if we are delivering changes more often that means we're practicing the deployment process the the delivery process and we're getting better and better at it because we're doing it so often. You can imagine that a company like Amazon, which releases thousands of changes a day, thousands of software releases a day, is going to be far better at releasing software code than a company that only releases code once every three to six months. In a DevOps organization, we learn to change often. We should be able to push our code changes at any time of the day without impacting our services. Companies like Amazon and Netflix have shown us that they're able to deploy software code hundreds, even thousands of times a day. Well, inevitably, the question is, I mean, how are these companies able to do that? I mean, how are they able to make so many changes every day? Because you're probably thinking that there are certain types of software changes that you just simply can't make in the middle of the day. You have to, you have to create a, a maintenance window and shut down your software for a period of time to update it or to, it, to update the database and so on. I mean, how, how can you make changes to something like a database schema in the middle of the day, in the middle of the day? Well, there are ways to do that. If, if you are an engineer and you think about it thoughtfully, there are ways that you can make database changes in the middle of the day or changes you can make that don't require any sort of, uh, of any sort of maintenance window. But these changes have to be designed 
carefully and thoughtfully. There is a strategy called a zero downtime deployment strategy, which you can employ and you can leverage things like evolutionary database design techniques to, to gradually transform your database schema from its current state into a desired state. It's something like evolutionary database design takes and now it requires more steps. And, and so it, it is a little bit more complex from that standpoint, but it doesn't require maintenance windows in your software platform. And you might be thinking, well, why, why don't all these traditional organizations just follow these practices? Why don't they use evolutionary database design? Why don't they implement a zero downtime deployment strategy? Well, because something like evolutionary database design, it might require you to do three separate deployments in, or, in order to get to a desired state. In order to fully deploy a new feature, you might have to, to do three or four deployments. And if your traditional software organization is deploying once a quarter or twice a year, then you know, you're not going to wait. You're not going to wait an entire year or year and a half to deploy a new feature. You're just going to push it out in sort of one big bang deployment, even if that requires a maintenance window. On the other hand, if your company is able to deploy changes several times a day, then deploying a new feature might occur, you know, using an evolutionary database design process might occur within a matter of hours. And it's easy. And that's the major difference is the, is the rate of, de, uh, of change, the, the embracing of change. Our traditional software organizations can't do this stuff because their, their deployments happen so slowly. Whereas modern software delivery organizations, they have a rate of change in deployments, which is far higher. And so they're able to leverage things like evolutionary database design in order to support a zero downtime deployment strategy.